Hi folks, I'm Adam, your instructor. Welcome to the Laney College Machine Shop. Today, we're going to be working on the Finderscope project for Machine Tech 210, the introductory course in machining and manufacturing. Specifically, we're going to be working on the tube, which is essentially the primary structural component of the Finderscope, to which all other components assemble. We're going to take this 1 inch ID by 1 and a half inch OD aluminum tube and turn it into this part, doing all the lathe work. Before we get started on the machine, let's just take a few moments to review the features on the three-dimensional solid model and the specifications on the drawing. The three-dimensional solid model shows that this part, like the name suggests, is really just a tube. It has two diameters on it, where the transition between the two is a 45 degree chamfer. We can also see that there are a number of holes on the outside, one more or less in the center, and then three which are equally spaced around the circumference of the tube. We're going to use a milling machine to pop those holes in there, and that'll be the subject of the following video, so we'll ignore those for now. If we create a cross-sectional view, then we can see inside the tube, which is actually more complex than you might first think just looking at the outside. There's a sort of long straight section in the center, but then there are counterbores on either side. And on one side, in fact, there are two counterbores, one of which has some screw threads in it. So this part is going to require machining on both the outside and the inside, and that's going to make this quite interesting. All right, here's the drawing. Before we jump into the views, let's look at a lay of the land. Down in the title block at the bottom right, we can see that the title of the part is Tube. Next to that on the left, we can see that the material is going to be 6061 T6 aluminum alloy, and the finish is going to be a type 2 black anodize, which we will discuss in another video. Further to the left, you can see the tolerance block, which specifies our standard shop tolerances for the different dimensions on the print, where no other tolerance is specified. These are all based off of significant digits, so the number of places after the decimal point determines the tolerance of that dimension. We'll also be looking for a standard 125 micro inch finish on all of the surfaces, and we're going to interpret everything on this print according to ASME Y14.5-2018, the most recent standard for print specifications. Okay, looking at the views themselves, we can see essentially the same view we were just looking at on the right side. So this is a cross-sectional view, the tube cut in half, and we are looking at the outer profile and the inner profile. There are a bunch of dimensions which specify the diameters of the round features as well as the various lengths. You can also see that there are a number of chamfers specified here, and a chamfer is really just a diagonal facet on an otherwise square edge. On the left-hand side of the view, there is a cutting plane line, which reveals another cross-sectional view shown to the left. The purpose of this view is to show the orientation of the three radially spaced holes. But we're going to ignore this and the other information that has to do with the holes because, of course, we're not going to be doing that in this video. So let's simplify the drawing a little bit. Okay, that's a little bit better. It's still kind of busy, but we'll live with it. Let's try to get a sense of the overall dimensions of this part so that we know what we're dealing with. It looks like the largest diameter is going to be the one and a half inch stock surface of the tube that we're going to use as raw material. The overall length is specified as 5 inches 800 thousandths, so 1.5 inch by almost 6 inches is the size that you should visualize in your head. Okay, looking at the dimensions a little bit closer now, we can see that the largest outside diameter of the part is going to be that 1.5 inch stock surface, but we're going to take a minimum cut just to clean it up and create a nice machined surface to get rid of any defects that... Um, may be present on that stock surface. 
the outside diameter on the other side of the part is going to be 1 inch 380 thousandths. It'll be 2 inches long with a 45 degree transition between the two diameters. Moving on to the inside of the part, we can see that that long center section is going to be 1 inch and 60 thousandths. The stock size for the inside is going to be 1 inch, so again, this is more or less just a cleanup cut. The counterbore on that side of the part is a feature that we're going to want to pay very, very close attention to, because the tolerance is pretty tight. You can see that it's specified as a limit dimension, with 1 inch 124 thousandths being the lower limit and 1 inch 125 thousandths being the upper limit. The depth of this counterbore is going to be 1 inch. On the other side of the part, we can see that there's another counterbore, which is a little bit deeper. It goes one and a half inches into the part, but its diameter is one inch 130 thousandths, which is essentially the same diameter as on the other side, but has a much, much looser tolerance. Finally, there's another counterbore, which has a depth of 588 thousandths and a diameter of one inch 265 thousandths, plus five thousandths minus three thousandths, so the tolerance is specified directly next to the dimension here. There are also some screw threads which are depicted here, and those are specified as one and five sixteenths dash sixteen threads, which have a depth of three hundred thousandths. Okay, that's pretty much it for the print, but there are two notations that I would like to point out here, and those are the little numbers inside of the triangles. Those indicate that the features they're attached to have special fit requirements to features on other drawings in the drawing packet, which are similarly labeled. For example, the number one label corresponds to the outside diameter of the threaded insert, which needs to have a one to two thousandths press fit into that hole after anodizing. The number two label, on the other hand, corresponds to the inside diameter of the shield, which should have a three to ten thousandths clearance. All right, I think we're ready to start making some chips. Let's head out to the shop. So the first step is to cut our stock. So go ahead and take a combination square and set it to six inches. And then we're going to use that as a sort of like a stop to set the stick out of the uh, stock material in the bandsaw. Tighten it, double check it, all right, and then we'll cut all the way through. Remember that this is the one inch ID or inside diameter by one and a half inch OD or outside diameter aluminum tube, and the specific alloy is 6061T6. It's a very, very common grade, um, still pretty soft like all aluminum, but harder than um, some of the unalloyed grades. Go ahead and file off the edges so that you don't hurt yourself or cause any issues when mounting it in the work holding device. Be kind to the next person and do this to the stock material before you return it to the stock rack too. Let's gather up some tools. First, we'll need the turning facing tool slash chamfering tool, which we ground out of high speed steel. We'll also need an indexable boring bar with a carbide insert, specifically this insert. We'll need a 1 and 1 16th high speed steel twist drill and a 1 and 5 16th 16 tap. All right, onto the lathe. Using a chuck key, open up the jaws on the three jaw chuck and insert the part. Use a ruler to set the stick out to approximately four and a half inches. Tighten it down, good and snug. Install your right hand turning tool. And I don't know if you can see this, but the tool nose is actually kicked out a few degrees to the left to provide a little bit of clearance behind the cutting edge because this tool we're gonna to use for both facing and turning operations. Turn on the lathe and then bump the tool up against the end of the part just so that it touches, takes a little chip. Then set the DRO to zero on the Z axis. Now we're gonna move in a little bit, something like 20 thousandths, and then we're gonna zero that out again, and we're gonna take a cut. We're gonna use the power feed to do this. So go ahead and engage that power feed and take a cut across. And this hopefully will just take the minimal amount of material to fully clean that surface. Okay, so when you're done, 
we'll move over to the outside diameter of the part and we'll do kind of a similar thing, right? We're going to just bump the tool into the outside diameter. Then we're going to zero out the x-axis, back the tool off, and then now we're going to move the tool in, let's say 10 thousandths, re-zero, and then I like to mark up the surface with a Sharpie so I know where I've removed material. Then just a little bit of WD-40 as a lubricant, and we'll engage the power feed in the z-axis. Now, I'm not going to show you how to set spindle speeds or feed rates in this video because that was covered in another video. I'm also not going to talk about what speeds and feed rates I'm using here because that is actually part of the activity to calculate that on your own. And there is a separate video uh, on calculating those two parameters. But this cut is looking pretty good. And as you can see, it's removing Sharpie all the way around. Uh, so we know that we are getting a full 100% cleanup. There's another part, the dew shield, which fits onto this surface, but the stock that we're using for that is already pretty close to size, so we don't want to remove too much material here, just a minimum, but we do want a nice machine surface. As you're taking this cut, be watching the digital readout, and once you get to just about 4 inches, go ahead and stop the feed. So that's perfect right there. Back the tool off and we'll go back to the beginning of the cut. Here I'm just rotating by hand to ensure that it cleaned up everywhere and it did. Loosen the chuck jaws, pop out the part. Now we're gonna install these copper shims so that these serrated chuck jaws don't damage the uh, machine surface we just made. And uh, install the part, use the ruler to set a stick out of about three inches. Tighten it all back down. So now we're going to touch off on the end of the part again, so just until we see a tiny little chip. Then we're going to zero out the z-axis. We're going to move in, yeah, like 20 thousandths to take a cleanup cut on this side. A little bit of WD-40 and engage the cut. If you get chip buildup like that, just turn off the spindle and use a brush to knock it off. Now we're going to remove the part again because we need to measure it with a caliper. That looks like 5 inches, 937,000. So, write that down. Put the part back in, 3 inches stick out, and we're going to uh, clamp it all back down. Now we're going to have to refine the end of the part, because we removed the part and put it back in, so we kind of lost our position. Uh, so we're going to do another touch-off here, but it's just going to be the absolute minimal touch-off. We don't want to take too big of a bite here. That looks pretty good. So now we're going to switch to the set mode on the digital readout and press the z-axis button and here we're going to enter 5 inches 937 thousandths enter essentially what we've done here is instead of setting the zero reference for the tool on the end of the part that we just touched we set the zero reference on the opposite end that's sort of inside of the uh, of the chuck right now so hypothetically all we would need to do is just cut enough material to get to our overall size. So from 5.937 down to 5.8. But we're not gonna take that all in one go. Let's take cuts of approximately 50 thousandths of an inch. And the first one we're gonna do at 5.9. So let's go ahead and take that cut. And then we're going to back the tool off, back to the start position, and go in to five inches 850 and then we're going to take that cut once that cuts done move back to the start position again and now we'll go into let's say five inches 810 and we'll leave ten thousandths of an inch for a finish pass go ahead and take this last roughing pass so you should be familiar with the uh, the little dance here back to the beginning we'll dial in that last ten thousandths give it a little spritz and then take the cut Okay, now we're going to touch off on the outside diameter again, just as before. Light touch off, back the tool away, and then we're going to go back to the zero mode on the digital readout, and zero out that x-axis. And actually, I'm going to move the tool to the position where we just took our last cut, because I want to zero it out there, because we want to go two inches into the part from here. So I'm going to dial in, let's say, a cut of 50 thousandths of an inch on the x-axis. Let's just try it out. 
and zero the X, and also zero the Z, as I just mentioned. Okay, engage the cut. Let's see how it does. And looking pretty good so far. No, I spoke too soon. Okay, that right there is called a bird's nest, and that is a problem. Now, the reason that this is happening is that sometimes ductile materials like aluminum have trouble forming discrete individual chips. Instead of breaking, they form these long, continuous strands that end up getting bunched up around the tool, or even worse, the chuck. This poses several problems, chief amongst them being that it can be very, very dangerous. So we definitely have to do something about this. The tool that we're using here was intended to be a general purpose tool for use in a wide variety of materials and cutting conditions, but it's not optimized for any particular material, especially not aluminum. If anything, it's closer to being optimized for steel. It's something that we can work around. We'll just need to figure out the right combination of feeds and speeds and depth of cut to get this thing to behave. But just in case you're interested, this is what an aluminum optimized tool might look like. The characteristic feature here is the chip breaker, which is that big scoop on top. The chip breaker forces the aluminum flowing onto the top of the tool to sort of circle back around on itself. This type of tool is suitable for roughing operations because it likes a heavy cut and a fast feed rate. These are pretty hefty chips, so this is actually a great opportunity to take a closer look at a chip. As the material is sheared off of the workpiece by the cutting tool, it gets curved, and in that process, the inside of the chip gets compressed and bunched up, producing a rough surface. The outside of the chip, on the other hand, actually gets put under tension, or pulled apart, producing a noticeably smoother surface. For finishing operations, the tool might look something like this. Similar chip breaker design, a little bit smaller, slightly different angle, but same idea. So here I'm just testing out some settings. This is all kind of experimental. So a little bit faster, a little bit slower feed rate, a little bit uh, deeper, a little bit shallower depth of cut, you know, just trying to see what sticks. And it turns out that most of the things I tried didn't really work very well, but the thing that got the best results was just reducing the depth of cut to 30 thousandths of an inch. So that's what we're going to end up doing here. Now that I'm done futzing about, I really do need to take a measurement. So at the end of a cut and without moving the tool, I'm going to take a measurement with a micrometer. That looks like 1 inch 465 thousandths. So we'll go back into set mode on the digital readout, hit the X axis button, and then punch in 1 inch 465 thousandths, enter. Now we've told the digital readout that the tool is positioned where it needs to be to cut a diameter of 1 inch 465 thousandths. So hypothetically, all we need to do from this point is just take successive cuts until we cut down to the number that we want, 1 inch 380 thousandths. Now first I'm just going to take a couple of uh, cleanup cuts to get this entire diameter um, down to the same size. And it turns out that got me down to 1 inch 400 thousandths, which is only 20 thousandths away from the final dimension, and that's a good size for a finished pass, so I'll take that all in one go. Take the cut. And it looks like those chips are behaving reasonably well, but they're not really breaking. So one of the things that you can do is just periodically stop the power feed, just, just for a moment, just so that the, the chip breaks off and it doesn't get wrapped around anything. It leaves a little bit of a mark on the finished surface, which is not ideal, but it's better than having a bird's nest. As we're getting close to the end of the cut, we want to watch the digital readout and stop just short and move in the rest of the distance by hand. All right, and then we can back out the tool and take a final measurement. Looking pretty close. So now we're going to flip the tool around and we're going to use the chamfering tool on the other side. Now we're going to position our tool close to the diameter and shoulder we just created, and using a 2000 shim, we're going to run the tool in with the cross slide just until we feel a gentle tugging on that shim, telling us that we are close to, but not touching, the diameter. 
turn the spindle on, give it a spritz, and then move the carriage in by hand to take out that square shoulder and put a 45 degree chamfer on it. And the object of the game here is really just to blend the transition between the two surfaces. So it's kind of by eye, and uh, this is looking pretty good here. Now we can take out the tool, and we're gonna put in a drill, an inch and a 16th drill. The integrated taper is too small for the tailstock of the lathe, so we'll use an adapter. Make sure the tapers are nice and clean, line up the tang, and then jam them together to get them to lock. Now do the same thing with the adapter and the tailstock quill. Line it up, jam it in. Now bump up the tailstock so the drill is close to the part. Lock the tailstock in place. Turn the spindle on, give it a spritz, and then we're going to crank the uh, handle on the tailstock to drive that drill through the part minimum four and a half inches deep. It'll take a little while. Back it out, then loosen the tailstock and back it off. To remove the drill, crank the handle in reverse all the way until the tapers pop loose. Now we can install the boring bar. This tool is different than the others because it's made out of carbide, not high-speed steel. This is the carbide insert here, screwed onto the end of the round steel bar. Just FYI, the geometry of this insert is optimized for aluminum. And as a side note, when you're installing a boring bar into a tool holder like this, make sure that you rotate the boring bar so that the line on the top of the bar is sort of top dead center, so it should be aligned to the set screws uh, in the tool holder. It doesn't look like it is in this picture because of the perspective, but trust me, it is. And it is important to make sure that the cutting edge is at the right angle. The other thing I guess I should mention is that you want to make sure that the stick out of the boring bar from the front of the tool holder is at least as long as the depth of the bore you want to machine. In this case, that's at least one inch. More is okay, but too much stick out, say more than four times the diameter of the boring bar, and you'll run into issues with vibration and poor surface finish, a phenomenon which machinists call chatter. Okay, turn on the spindle, and we're going to do a light touch off on the end of the part. And zero out the Z axis there. Now we're gonna touch off on the inside diameter. Zero out the X axis, Dial in a minimal cleanup cut of like ten thousandths of an inch. Zero out the x-axis again, give it a spritz, and then we're going to take a cleanup cut. And again, once you get close, stop it, and then go the rest of the way to your number uh, by hand-feeding the carriage. Now you can back it out, and we'll take a measurement with a telescoping gauge. The way to use this is to stick it into the hole at an angle, lock it, and then pivot it on one of the anvils to remove it from the hole. This way the anvils will collapse to whatever the size of the hole is, and they won't spring back out when you remove it from the hole. Measure over that with a micrometer, and sort of rock it back and forth to find the true measurement. That looks like 1 inch and 70 thousandths. So set mode on the DRO, hit the x-axis button, and then key in 1.070. I'm going to do this in two cuts, so position the tool at 1 inch and 15 thousandths. Take that first cut. Seems to be behaving pretty well. Pull it out at the end of the cut. Then we'll take one more measurement just to make sure that we are really hitting our numbers. And yeah, that looks great, so let's go for it. One inch, 125 thousandths on the dot. Give it a spritz and engage. And I am using a slower feed rate here because I want a good surface finish. This is a critical surface. It has a tight tolerance and it needs to have a good fit to the part that assembles in here. Okay, pull out the tool. Now folks, I did take a measurement here after taking the final cut. And for whatever reason, I didn't capture it on camera, but I assure you it was right on the money, so we're looking very good. All right, we're done with the boring bar for now, and back to the chamfering tool. But this time we're going to want to flip the chamfering tool around, 
so that it's pointing at the part, like this. This way we can cut a chamfer on both the ID and the OD of the part. Let's do ID first. So position the tool so that the flank just touches that inside corner. Then zero the Z axis, give it a spritz, and then we're gonna feed by hand to our final dimension, which is 15 thousandths. Pull it back and we'll do the same thing on the OD here. Just touch off, zero the X, feed in by hand to our final dimension, which should be 30 thousandths of an inch right there, and back away. Now we can take out the part and work on the other side. We're actually getting pretty close to done here. Stick out should be like two inches. Tighten it all back down, and we're going to need the boring bar again. Okay, so we're going to touch off on the end of the part as we've done so many times before. Zero the z-axis, and then we're also going to touch off on the inside diameter. And zero the x-axis. Now we can dial in a cut of... Yeah, let's say 20 thousandths just to clean up this surface. Zero the X again, and let's see what happens. Okay, looking pretty good. Getting close to the one and a half inch length dimension, so I'm going to go ahead and stop. Again, feeding by hand to the final one and a half inch length dimension. Pull it out. And you know what? We didn't clean up all the way. You can still see some of the old surface in there. So let's dial in another 30 thousandths of an inch, just to make sure we clean it up this time. Zero the X, take another cut. I think that's going to do it for sure. All right, we're going to take a measurement here so we can set our digital readout. Let's see where we are. That looks like one inch and 32 thousandths. We're going to set the X axis to that value, one inch and 32 thousandths. And at this point, we should simply have to cut to our final dimension of 1 inch 130. But let's do that in a few cuts. So let's take one at 1 inch and 80 thousandths. Taking the cut now. Looking good. All right, and now we're going to take another cut of... You know what? Let's just go all the way. This is not a critical surface. Let's do 1 inch 130 thousandths. Give it a little spritz. And away we go. Ooh, those chips look monstrous. Maybe a lighter cut was in order. Okay, anyway, we're going to take a measurement here, make sure that we actually nailed our final diameter. And yeah, we're right there. Okay, I'm going to dial this in to 1 inch 180 for the next diameter and take the cut. But this time, we are only going to go 588 thousandths deep. Right there. Back out the tool and... Let's go in another, gosh, I don't know. Let's do one inch, 255. So that'll leave us 10 thousandths of an inch for a final cut. All right, let's take a measurement to make sure that we're still cutting on size. And we are, good. So let's go all the way to one inch, 265 thousandths of an inch. Little spritz. All right, feeding on the final cut. Looking good. Face towards center to produce a nice flat shoulder at the bottom of the bore. All right, final measurement. Let's see if we got it. I'm pretty sure we nailed it. Okay, like a half a thousandths oversize. Still not too bad. All right, we need the chamfering tool again. And we'll put a chamfer on the inside diameter. This time, we need to feed in by hand to a depth of... I believe it's 50 thousandths of an inch, right there. Okay, back it out, we'll do something similar on the outside diameter, but this time uh, I think we're only gonna go 30 thousandths of an inch. There we go. All right, now we can pull that tool out, and we're gonna go back to the tailstock with a drill chuck. Make sure that the tapers are clean, Line up the tool, jam it in, and we're going to insert this tool called a spring-loaded tap guide into the drill chuck. So open it up until it fits, and then crank it back down. 
This is the special 1 and 5 sixteenths dash 16 tap that we're going to use. And this is the comically oversized tap handle that we're going to use to drive it. So go ahead and stick the tap in, tighten the jaws down around the square drive, and then we're going to use this hole on the back in the spring-loaded tap guide to make sure that this thing is on center. Run the tailstock forward a little bit to preload everything, baste it in WD-40 or your lubricant of choice, and then I like to apply a sharpie mark on the top of the part so that I can track rotations. By the way, the tap handle should be sort of resting on the carriage like this to keep it from spinning, because we're actually going to be rotating the chuck and the part rather than rotating the tap. Like this. So the spindle is in neutral right now, so it's easy to rotate. And two rotations just based on that sharpie mark. And we want to go to a total of five rotations, because the depth that we want to tap is 300 thousandths, and this is a 16 TPI uh, tap. And so that means that for five rotations, we get a depth of just over 300 thousandths. All right, and then rotate the other way to pop that tap back out. Looks like it went pretty well, nice clean threads. And that's it, this part is done at least the lathe operations anyway. There are still some milling operations, and then this part actually needs to get anodized, and then there is another component which needs to get press fit assembled into the end of it. But for this video, we are done. So if you made it this far, congratulations. Give yourself a pat on the back, two pats, <laughs> if this is the uh, first machined part that you've ever made. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.